be going over natural regeneration. Uh, and with natural regeneration, this is the first uh, lecture in our establishment treatment unit. And so we've already covered all the regeneration treatments. And we're focusing on natural regeneration first uh, because it's a good linkage between the regeneration treatments and the establishment treatments. Uh, so in some silvicultural systems like a shelter wood, you may not need any establishment treatments. You know, the regeneration method may achieve successful establishment of a new cohort, and then you've naturally regenerated the stem. Uh, so today what I want to focus on is a lot of ecology. We'll look at planted trees a little bit because there's some overlap between planted trees and naturally regenerated trees. Uh, but then we'll focus heavily on how natural regeneration in many of our regeneration methods may play out uh, depending on different regions, different silvicultural systems, different species, a uh, number of other factors. So to get you all started thinking about that, uh, you all can go ahead and split up into groups and then come up with the top five ecological factors that you think may reduce uh, the survival of natural regeneration following a uh, regeneration method. And so take a few minutes, come up with a list in your groups. Normally we would write them up on the board, but I don't think we quite have enough board space here uh, this semester. Uh, so we'll sort of go over what you came up with. In your group. Okay, so what are some of the answers you all came up with? What factors do you think are going to reduce survival with natural regeneration? Yeah, Justin. So competition. So vegetative competition is going to be a big one. What else? So flooding drought, too much water, too little water. So soil water. Um, I think I heard someone over here say one. So disturbances. Okay, so flooding is one disturbance, but I heard a group up over here mentioning fire. There are certainly others. Yeah, so heat and that can combine with water too. Uh, but yeah, too cold is one we don't think about here too often, uh, but that can definitely be a problem. Yeah, Kyle. Right. Okay, so light, and sometimes that may play a role with competition, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so soil quality in terms of what? What aspects of quality? Okay, so we're thinking about nutrients and we're also thinking about physical variables like compaction. Yeah, those will definitely play a role. What other factors are y'all thinking? Yeah, so wildlife. So we've got herbivory predation. Will's got a picture of a cow here on his hat. So depends on how wild the wildlife is. Yeah, don't get Grogan going on cows and seedlings. Yeah. What, what other factors? Yeah, so, so I think what genetics will do is, you know, all these other variables we've named, it may like make a particular seedling less suited uh, to handle those conditions. But yeah, that's definitely a factor. Anything else that we're missing that anyone else picked up on? Yeah, so you may be, you know, in a situation where you just don't have much seed um to start with so that could exacerbate all the conditions we've been thinking about so yeah i think somebody said compaction yeah i think ryan was saying that was soil quality but compaction may be a big one uh, a lot of these things we can do different silvicultural treatments to fix uh, some of these things you may not be able to do too much about uh, but they're all important considerations um, what i wanted to do i know we're talking about natural regeneration today but I wanted to start with some planted seedlings because some of these factors are really going to overlap with planted trees and naturally regenerated trees. And so I don't know how well y'all are going to be able to see this. It looks like we've got full sun coming right in this time of year. Uh, but this was a study that we did a few years ago. TPWD funded it. And we went out on four different sites here in East Texas. Um, and we planted a whole bunch of seedlings, nut all oak, Schumard oak, bur oak. Um, and we planted them under intact forest canopies, under forests that we had mulched to kind of simulate a low thin to let more light in. We planted them in open fields where we just flat planted them. We planted them in open fields where we did a ripping treatment to break up any plow pans or old field compaction. Uh, we did different herbicide treatments out here and we did different treatments to try and exclude uh, different animals that might predate our seedlings. 
Um, and so this study was set up in the Blackland Prairie and post Oak Savannah eco regions, just west of the Piney Woods eco region where we are now. And so some of those factors you all were talking about flooding and drought, they're probably even more of a problem here than they might be here in the Piney Woods. And part of that then links into the soils. You are, were mentioning soils. And so a lot of these soils hold a lot of two to one clays, such as smectite clays. And the issue with those clays is when they get wet, they swell up. And when you, they get real dry, they shrink down. So they're shrink swell soils. So that'll kind of shred root systems throughout the year. It creates one problem that way, just damaging root systems. But on top of that, in the summer, when these things get real hot and they really dry out, they can be denser than concrete. They can have bulk densities pretty much at or slightly above concrete. And then when they swell up in the winter, it's hard for water to penetrate through them, to infiltrate through them. And so you end up with, you know, a lot of ponding and a lot of flooding. So, and the other problem that they run into is they're really variable soils. And so what's the parent material for a lot of these soils gonna be on our bottomlands throughout the South? Where did the material that the soil formed from come from? So some of it comes from trees that fall down and decompose. That's where they're gonna get some of their organic matter. Yeah. Where do the mineral particles come from that the soil? Yeah, they're deposited by water. So alluvial would be our term for that, where the, these are alluvial soils, the parent materials uh, come from somewhere upstream. And so because of that, uh, we'll look at this more later this semester when we talk about bottom line hardwoods, how they deposit out really varies a lot depending on how close you are to the stream and what your micro topography is. So these are some photos that Luke Oliver took of soils that were pretty close to each other in proximity, uh, but they had really different colors, different textures. So a lot of variability there. Um, these are some more photos that Luke Oliver took on his study site. And so you can see these were from plots that were mulched. So you see a lot of the mulch from where we simulated those low thins there. But all, all these photos are of is flagged sticks. Because what happened is after planting all these seedlings in this study, feral hogs came in and uprooted them and chewed the roots off almost immediately. And so we had almost complete mortality on pecan on a number of Luke sites here. And so they would actually pull every pecan out of the ground, eat the roots off of it, and then they would hit a few oaks, realize they weren't pecan, turn around and go back for more pecan. Um, so they really seemed to prefer the pecan in this particular trial. Uh, we tried all sorts of fencing treatments just to see how they would work out. Um, this was an example of a three wire electric fence um, where you'll see this more around here for like food plots or smaller areas like that. But the idea is, you know, deer can jump right over this thing. Uh, but I guess it, it tricks them a little in that you have two wires. One will be about three feet off the ground, one about a foot off the ground. And then a few feet in front of that on the outside of the plot, you have another wire that's about two feet off the ground. So it messes with them visually a little bit. But that wire in the front, it, it's a ribbon. And so you just pull it off the end of the spool so it stays curled around, so it's very visible to them. So they'll come up, they'll sniff that, they'll get zapped and they'll stay out of that area. So you gotta electrify them immediately or it's not gonna be effective because they could easily jump over it or run right through it. Uh, they, they proved reasonably effective, but in this particular example, a pig, not a deer, happened to run right through it and so then it went from being an exclosure to an enclosure. So it sort of trapped it in there for a while and it killed pretty much every seedling in that small plot. Um, it looked like a lot of them, it wasn't uprooting them and eating them so much as it was going after a down dead log and pulling grubs and stuff out of it. And in the process of doing that, it sort of, you know, just trampled everything. So, so lots of damage from hogs is, is a distinct possibility. Um, with the deer, you'll get a little top clipping um, in some parts of the country. This can be in a significant form of seedling mortality. Um, so I've seen areas in the Lake States in Wisconsin, for example, in New York, Pennsylvania, where the deer densities are high enough that they really just don't get any natural regeneration. The deer will just mow everything pretty much down. And so they've got to come up with some sort of treatment to prevent that mortality. These electric fences are effective, but they, you know, you got to maintain the batteries. They're expensive. Lots of maintenance here. It's probably not a viable long-term solution in many cases. So you will see eight foot high fence. We, we tried out eight foot high fence in this study. And of course the eight foot high fence is pretty effective. 
A deer can jump over it if it really, really wants to, but it's about the most effective thing we've got. But the problem with eight foot high fence is what? Cost, it's expensive. Um, especially, I'll show you some photos in a moment, especially around here, you gotta build them really, really sturdy. Uh, and so on the left there, what you have if you're planting trees, uh, that's an individual tree shelter. Those may run you a dollar or two a piece. And if, keep in mind, even with a hardwood tree, you may only be talking about a 50 cent seedling. So they're expensive, but that's a more realistic level of cost uh, for at least small acreages you're gonna plant uh, than maybe putting up a high fence. Uh, the problem with high fence in bottomlands around here, that's about one foot still showing there on the left on top of an eight foot high fence. So there's about seven feet of water on this site. So you gotta build these things real sturdy in our bottomlands, because this can happen. You gotta put a lot of cement in on the corners, uh, build them real well. Um, and then of course you can have logs floating into them. So all sorts of issues there. Uh, to the bottom right, you can see some of the individual tree shelters uh, have flooded and are starting to move around. So in our bottom lands, you really have to stake those in good unless you have some very cheap labor that can spend a lot of effort going downstream, finding them, retrieving them and putting them back on your seedlings. So we had grad students in this case, so we were set on cheap labor, but uh, a better stake would probably be a, a much better solution. And then, you know, whether it's flooding or whether it's just the middle of the growing season where you can have herbaceous vegetation seven feet tall on some of our old fields around here, you need a lot of maintenance on all these treatments. That electric fence is not gonna work <laughs> once it's got all this debris on it and is in water. Uh, the electric fence isn't gonna work if vegetation grows into it, so you gotta keep it herbicided. And so a lot of maintenance with all of these. Uh, in your high fence in a forested area, trees are gonna fall on it, so. Uh, these end up being expensive treatments to keep seedlings out. The other challenge you run into is the unpredictability of the flooding regime. So when do we flood around here? In the winter, right? Well, this is a photo on the left. We're done with our winter flooding. The photo on the left is May 11th, 2015. The problem is the photo on the right is May 26th, 2015. Um, so that's Richland Creek WMA, where one of these study sites was located. And in that particular year, most of the year, they can only get out on the WMA by boat, okay? So if you have seedlings of most of our species that are underwater for significant periods during the growing season, they are done, okay? Even our most flood tolerant trees, bald cypress, for example, if you put a bald cypress seedling underwater for 30 days over the growing season, not 30 consecutive days, just 30 days spaced out, that tree will probably not grow in that year. It may survive, but it's not going to grow that year. So uh, flooding is going to be unpredictable. Again, herbivory is not just a problem in the south. Uh, this is an example from out in Arizona. Um, and so they had a real problem there, not with deer, but with elk. And they were trying to regenerate these trembling aspens. And so what they found is aspen regenerates from root sprouts, but the elk were just eating all the root sprouts. And so what you would find is you would go into these aspen stands and they would have lots of big trees, but a lot of the big trees would be dying. You'd have a lot of mortality there because each individual aspen tree does not live for long. They're relatively short lived species. Now the whole clone can live for a long time, but not if elk are eating all the young ones, then you end up losing aspen in that area. And so here what they're trying to avoid the expense of a high fence treatment and all these other things is they did some harvesting out here and they just left slash uh, in such a fashion that it would hopefully be as inconvenient as possible for the elk to get in there. So they're trying to use the slash to actually protect their seedlings. Um, in other areas, they had some nonprofit organizations that were raising money to put up high fence. And so it was really remarkable because inside these high fence exclosures, it was just loaded with hundreds of aspen per acre, all roots sprouting, doing great. Outside of them, there was absolutely nothing, okay? Um, and what they would do is they would let the regenerating aspen get high enough and then they would take those fences down and go put them up somewhere else if they could, uh, if they were still in good enough shape. The problem with elk is they're really big. <laughs> and so they needed to get these aspen up to 25 or 30 feet tall before they were big enough that an elk couldn't just knock it down and eat it. Um, so they actually had to grow them pretty large. We think about this with angiosperms, our hardwoods a lot, but herbivory can also be a problem with our gymnosperms. 
Here's an example. I took this photo where they planted some western red cedar in Oregon. I took that a couple of years ago. And again, the issue was elk. They had a lot of elk. Um, and I guess the western red cedar tastes better and they're more nutritious. So the elk were really going after them. Um, and so they use the individual tree shelters there on this one little small wet area within the clear cut where they were trying to get western red cedar to come back. So um, I've seen other examples of things they've done in Idaho, for example, areas where you get a lot of snow. What you'll find is, you know, the, the terminal bud will be sticking up out of the snow on a seedling or a sapling and there will be a browse line just based on snow height. And so they actually take little basically just pieces of tape called bud caps and you fold it in half and you put that little piece of tape over the bud. Um, and that just makes it less desirable to the wildlife to chomp that terminal bud off and it'll fall off on its own as the seedling starts growing in height again um, in the next spring. So people are trying all sorts of different things to prevent herbivory um, with both natural and artificial regeneration. And the treatments can be effective. The downside to all of them is just cost, time, money. Um, so that, that's really the downside. So there's a little bit of background on planted trees and some of that overlap we see with natural region. But then for the rest of this, we want to focus solely on natural regeneration. And so we've already talked about this and looked at this when we talked about seed trees and shelterwood. But the question is, can we get enough natural regeneration? And we know that when things go right, we absolutely can. And so we've seen data where Acadian forests in Maine that are dominated by spruce fir, hemlock, maple, birch, they can get 60,000 trees per acre. Southern Appalachians, there's data from North Carolina, yellow poplar, 50,000 trees per acre. Uh, coastal plain in our area, Mississippi and Louisiana for both sweet gum and longleaf pine, 6,000 trees per acre. So we can get these really, really high densities. And if we get the high densities, again, keep in mind what we're trying to do. You maybe want 100 of these trees or 200 of these trees to make it to the end of the rotation. That's about it. And so you've got a lot of wiggle room there for a whole heck of a lot of herbivory. Um, so a lot of them can die as long as a few of them make it. Okay, so what we're gonna go over here is different forms of advanced regeneration with a pretty heavy focus on stump sprouting because stump sprouting is one of our most important forms of regeneration. And then we'll talk about root sprouting, existing seedlings, we'll get data on all those. And then at the end, we'll wrap up with a little bit of data on natural seed regeneration. And that natural seed might come from a variety of different sources. So you can get seed raining in from adjacent stands. You can get seed from trees you intentionally retain, the overwood in a shelter wood, uh, the seed trees in a seed tree cut. Uh, you can get seed from serotonous cones that are left out on your site that are finally opened by a fire. Uh, or you can get seed coming in from the seed bed itself. So lots of different potential sources of seed. Uh, you'll hear some different terms on sprouting. You may have noticed in the reading that you're distinguishing between stool sprouts, stump sprouts, root sprouts, seedling sprouts. So there's lots of different jargon around sprouting. But what we have to keep in mind is what it's all coming from. And this is all going to be buds. So if you have a foot diameter stump and it's sprouted, so you see an example there looks like a little larger than a foot diameter on that stump. The sprouts all come from the outside of the stump. They don't come from the middle, they come from the outside. That's where your buds are. And those buds in general, most of the time are gonna form when the tree was that tall. So you're talking about a sapling or a seedling when those buds were formed. And so they have to maintain connection to the pith as that tree continues secondary growth over the years. You break connection to the pit, that bud is no longer viable, and you don't get a sprout coming out in that location. Okay, so that's going to come up more and more as we start looking at some of this data. Occasionally, you hear about a stool sprout, and that's something you occasionally see out in the woods around here where you've cut a tree down and that tree uh, shares a root system or is grafted to other trees of the same species around it. And essentially, it's just part of their root system then, and the stump will heal over. So you'll see that rarely. The stool sprout term was more often used when they used coppice systems. Um, and we'll talk about those in a moment, but that's where you're trying to keep reusing the same stumps to get them to re-sprout over and over and over again. I saw this kind of interesting example, maybe hard to see with our light conditions in the classroom today. 
Um, but this was a clear cut out uh, in Oregon and Douglas fir, but there were other conifers out here. And so it's kind of neat as you look around these clear cuts, they had just clear cut about a 40 year old Douglas fir plantation. And so the stumps they had just clear cut were all, you know, one to two feet in diameter. But that stand would have been about 40 years old. So 40 years before that, they might have cut an old growth stand out there on that site. And so those stumps are all much, much larger. It might even have been two rotations ago when they would have been using crosscut saws and axes prior to 1950 uh, to fell these trees. And so some of those stumps that they might have used springboards on where they cut notches in them and put the springboards in to actually stand on to give them a platform up higher to use a crosscut saw or an ax to fell the tree. So those stumps are all like eight feet high, six feet high, and they're, you know, you know, 10 feet wide, you know, really, really big stumps that are just rotting, but are still there a hundred years later, several rotations later. And so you can see evidence of multiple rotations. So what that photo is of, uh, it's one of these really big old growth stumps. And then growing on top of it, they wouldn't have planted a tree on top of it, but it's a tree that would have germinated from natural seed on top of that, grew up into a big, you know, 100 plus foot tall tree, and then they cut that down in this recent clear cut, and then that stump is sprouting. So I was trying to get people to decide if that would be called a stump stump sprout, maybe a super stool, but no, no clear guidance on jargon for that one just yet. But, but it was neat because in one little spot you could see at least three rotations, maybe four rotations evidence out on the ground. So we really, we really don't think about that in our part of the world where things decomp much quicker. Okay, so I had mentioned coppicing. Whenever you hear coppicing, you wanna keep in mind, are they talking about it ecologically or are they talking about it silviculturally? And every time I've heard it used in the South, people have been talking about it in that ecological context. So when foresters are talking sprouting in the South, they usually are just talking about, you know, coppicing being a stump sprout. That's all they mean. It's a synonym for a stump sprout. Um, in the silvicultural context, the eight regeneration methods that we have learned in class here this semester, they're all high forest methods. And so in the strict textbook sense, that means you're regenerating things from seed. I know we're gonna be using sprouting in some of these clear cuts and shelter woods and other high forest systems. Um, but really what a COPPA system is, you're managing for short rotations and small diameter stems sprouting off of stumps that you can use over and over and over again. And so we don't see them used because you would need a market where you want a high density of small stems, which is the opposite of our markets here. Even for pulpwood, we can't use them until they're four inches in diameter. And the more trees you move around, the more inconvenient it is to do that from an operational standpoint. And so you might have seen coppicing in Europe when everyone had fires, wood burning fires um, to heat their homes and cook on. And you wanted small stems there because these might have been small stoves. Um, you might have coppice in some areas where they're using wood for basketry or very specific uses where you need them in certain smaller diameter classes and you get them too large, they're, they're no longer useful for that particular product. But you really don't see coppice systems deployed hardly ever, if at all, um, in the U.S. these days or internationally. They're not very common anymore. So when you hear people use that, they're probably just talking stump sprouting, but probably more clear if you can just stay dump sprouting instead of coppicing. Okay, so what I wanna do now is go through a, a number of slides looking at different data on natural regeneration. And these first are gonna focus on stump sprouting because it's one of our more important uh, forms of advanced reproduction. And so these first data are for the Southern Appalachians. We're looking at a mixture of oaks out here and you've got three different bars on this graph. Um, and it's clear cut on the left, leaf tree in the middle, shelter wood on the right. The leaf tree, they're just referring to basically a seed tree with the ferment. So there's some retained over wood out there, uh, but probably not as much in the shelter wood where they've retained more over wood. And what we're seeing on the Y axis there is simply the percent of stumps that sprouted where higher is more. Now with a lot of these data today, you'll notice there's error bars on there and you'll notice there's letters above the bars, A, B, C. And so that's coming out of the statistics run on this data, where if two bars have the same letter on them, A and A, even though they may look different, you can't say they're different. There's so much variability, we just can't be confident those means are really different. 
if we had a greater sample size or if there had been less variability, maybe that is a real difference, but maybe it's just because of, you know, our small sample sizes relative to the amount of variability out there. So don't just use the height of the bars, look at the letter that's included there. So what's the effect of our regeneration methods on the percentage of stumps that sprout? Right, you get a higher percentage of stumps sprouting with clear cuts compared to the treatments that are gonna leave more shade. Which of these treatments are you gonna have more stumps in? Clear cut. So you not only have more stumps, but a greater percentage of them are sprouting. Now, each of these sets of three bars is that same data, clear cut on the left, and then the leaf tree, and then the shelter wood. Uh, but it's split up by five different species of oaks. So white oak, Quercus alba, and black oak on the far right, Quercus velutina, we learned in Dendro Lab here. The three in the middle are oaks not native in our area. So scarlet oak is Quercus coccinea. That chestnut oak has nothing to do with swamp chestnut oak. It's actually a xeric upland oak. It looks like swamp chestnut oak a little, but not the bark but that's Quercus Montana or Quercus Prinus. Um, and then that isn't Southern Red Oak where they have red labeled there, that's Northern Red Oak, Quercus Ruba. So, so as we look here now where we've got all these different species and you can see all those different letters up there denoting whether they're actually different from one another, what's the take home message on this one in terms of the impact of our regeneration methods on the percentage of stumps that are sprouting? Right, so you're still reducing the height. So clear cutting is producing the highest percentage of resprouts, but let's look at white oak on the far left. Is that true for white oak? See how it says C, C, C above them? That tells you they're all the same. We can't tell them apart, right? So in that case, it varies by species. So what's the answer to pretty much every question in silviculture? It depends, right? So for white oak, there's no clear leader. Uh, but then when you look at these and you look at maybe red oak, then Will, for red oak, you're exactly right. Where clear cutting definitely produced the most. Certainly as we look across these, it does look like clear cutting is going to produce the most. And if we had a lot more data, if we had unlimited time and money to go collect tons of data, you know, maybe we would see that more clearly, but there's a lot of variability. So one thing that's frustrating in silviculture, right, is that there's no one universal answer for everything. It really depends on a bunch of different factors. So here's one illustration of that. Here's another illustration. They did this study in two different physiographic provinces. So we have the ridge and valley on the left, plateau on the right. So different geologies that influences the soils that form in these two regions. And so what's the take home message from this one? So ridge and valley tends to be better than the plateau but if we look at that, is the ridge and valley shelter wood greater than the plateau clear cut? No, so again, it gets more complicated, right? So, you know, right idea, you'd have to phrase it a little more specifically to nail it down though, right? So for a given regeneration method, the ridge and valley is greater than the plateau. But we see kind of that same trend emerging. It's not as clear in the plateau, we see the two letter Ds over two of those treatments in the plateau. So, so if we look at it, the percentage of stumps that sprout varies by regeneration method, but that trend is different for different species and the trend is impacted by what region we're in. So lots of different conditionality there um, around our stump sprouting. So let's move on to a different example altogether. This is the Missouri Ozarks. And when we look at these mixed oak trees in the Missouri Ozarks, we're looking at black oak, white oak, and scarlet oak. You've got these complex graphs, right, where we've got it kind of three-dimensional now. But sort of the vertical axis going up, that's going to be the probability of sprouting. So instead of going from 0 to 100%, now we're going from 0 to 1, where we have it as a proportion. And then you've got the axis that's sort of uh, going roughly horizontally on here. And what you see there is on the far right of it, those are gonna be our smaller stumps. And then as we move this way to the left, they're larger stumps. And then the axis that's sort of coming in and out of the screen there, what we have is furthest back into the screen, those are 40 year old trees. And then as we come out to this front corner of these graphs, those are 160 year old trees. So it gets older as it comes out, it gets um, larger as it moves to the left. And as you move up on that plane, you get a higher probability of sprouting, okay? 
So in terms of tree size, what size stumps are the most probable to sprout? Large stumps or small stumps? Small stumps are more likely to sprout than large stumps. And then if we look at age, is it the young stumps or the older stumps that are more likely to sprout? Younger stumps. And you can see those two factors interact, right? On the shape of that plane. And so the stumps that are most likely to sprout are gonna be our young, small diameter oak stumps. The older they get and the larger they get, the less likely they are to sprout. And then as we look, we have the same general trend across all three of these oak species, but see how that plane is a slightly different shape. So for example, white oak may be steeper there. And so it may be even more important for white oak to make sure you have younger, smaller stumps. You may get a more, little more leeway there for black oak, uh, but it's the same broad pattern. And so remember, I said you had to have that connection to the pith with that bud. The older or the larger the stump gets, the more likely that connection to the pith is to break down. So, okay, so let's move on to some oaks a little bit closer to home. So now we've got cherry bark oaks in the Mississippi alluvial valley. Um, here they did a heavy thin and a light thin, and then they tracked it out from 1999 when they applied the treatments on out to 2003. Um, and as we look at this, you'll see an asterisk above one of the years there. That's the only year where they found the two treatments were statistically significantly different from one another. The other years, the error bars overlapped, they, they couldn't tell them apart. So which type of thinning was best? It looks like heavy thin because heavy thin is above light thin, but it really doesn't matter because they can't tell them apart. It's variable enough. And then even if you have a statistical difference or one number that's larger than another number, you also have to keep in mind, is that difference meaningful? And so here the difference is between like 31 and 38%. Um, so is that a huge difference in survival? Those are pretty similar numbers. You're gonna end up with pretty similar stands either way. There's another important take home message here. If you had gone out and assessed survival of these stump sprouts on cherry bark oak in 1999, that first year there on the far left, are you happy? 90% survival? I'd say you're happy, right? Yeah, the year after is a different story, right? And so we can't necessarily just rely on short-term data in forestry because uh, what we're doing is over a longer time period. So be careful anytime you see short-term data, it may not really reflect what you're actually gonna see. And so why do you think you have the survival on these cherry bark oak stump sprouts declining over time like that? Predation could be a factor, yeah. Flooding. Flooding could be a factor. Because probably one of them is becoming the dominant one and all the others just die off. So that's competition. So you might have competition on a stump and you might also have competition between the sprouts and other things. Um, and so here's data that directly addresses your theory there, Greg. So are you seeing some, some of the sprouts win out over others? Yeah, we, we see that. They go from about nine or 10 down to, you know, four or five or six uh, sprouts per clump. And so uh, competition is probably primarily driving this, but we know there's a whole bunch of other factors that could be occurring out here. Okay, so let's think about this. We're talking about stump sprouts now. So if you're at the end of a rotation, you have a valuable tree species like cherry bark oak, would you rather have that tree have originated as a stump sprout or as a seedling? Why seedling? Well, stump sprouts aren't really going to give you the large diameters, man. Stump sprouts can give you large diameters. A tree generated by a stump sprout can get just as large by the end of the rotation as a tree generated by seedling. If anything, they have a head start because they already have an intact root system to start with, right? And what the stem is actually which would be faster. Okay, let, let's say you, you are right. There are gonna be differences in how fast they grow and how likely they are to make it to a dominant tree at the end of the rotation. So those are good points. And we're gonna look at more on that in a moment. Uh, but let's just say you have two 20 inch DBH cherry bark oaks with this, you know, the same height. They're both hundred feet tall. Would you rather have that tree originating as a seedling or as a stump sprout? Seedling. So why seedling? Right, so you gotta think about the form. And so if it germinated as a seed and was competing intensely with a bunch of trees per acre, 
Hopefully it's grown up nice and straight. Now there could be variation here. You might have a fork tree, you might have a crook or something, but hopefully it's grown up nice and straight. It's self pruned well, and we'll go over log classification this afternoon in lab. Hopefully you have high grade soft sub out of that. When you have 10 trees germinating on a stump, the tendency is that they sweep out away from each other. They all move away from the middle of that old stump. And so your butt log will tend to have sweep in it. The other thing that's going on is you have connections between the pith of that stump sprout and the pith of your stump. And so if you end up with rot in the stump, you may have that rot cause more heart rot in a stump sprouted tree. Um, I've heard a lot of foresters talking about that as a major factor around here. Um, looking at it low, a lot of that data comes from the Southern Appalachians and yellow poplar. So I don't know how really prevalent it is around here, uh, but it is one factor you're gonna wanna be aware of. So the form on sprouted trees may be less desirable. There's another category we think about called a seedling sprout, and that's a stump sprout, but the stump is two inches in diameter or smaller. So it's when you cut down a sapling and it sprouts, and we call it a seedling sprout because a two inch diameter stump, you're only gonna get one or two coming off. And so they tend to have better form than off a larger stump. So by the end of the rotation, you look at that tree and you can't tell it apart from a seedling germinated tree. And so that's why we call it a seedling sprout. So less of an issue if your stump is very small. And so here's a photo again of you know, some of these cherry bark oak stumps. And so again, keep in mind, they're coming off the outside of that stump. So that was a bunch on oak, and we think about managing oaks a lot and using sprouts for uh, regenerating them. But here's an example with the gymnosperms. So that's pond cypress. So remember, pond cypress looks a lot like bald cypress, except the needles are oppressed. They're stuck up against the branch leaves. So from far away, they look like they have more pine-type needles rather than feather-like needles that bald cypress will have. But what we have in the graph on the top is the percent of stumps that sprout it. And, uh, on the bottom, it's number of sprouts per stump. And what you see on the x-axis for both graphs is smaller tree, smaller stumps on the left, larger stumps on the right. So is that the same trend we saw in oaks or different trends? Yeah, smaller stumps are more likely to sprout and have more sprouts per stump, okay? And so we're seeing the same trend for the exact same biological reason. Now this being pond cypress, we have to think about the flood regime, right? Where we know these pond cypresses are gonna be sites that flood pretty good. And so they looked at a few different treatments where they cut stumps low, they cut stumps medium, and they cut stumps high, just to see which gives you a better shot. And we got four time periods where we looked at data, May 99, October 99, May 2000, and October 2000. And so again, if you look in the first year, what you see is the high cut stumps are winning out. So you would think, hey, we should high cut these stumps. But by the end of the study in October 2000, high cut stumps are about the worst, same as medium cut stumps, um, and our low cut stumps are slightly better. So maybe you had a dry summer there in 2000 uh, that influenced what happened. But um, regardless, if you look at them, they're all you know right around 40%. So it's different. It may not be that meaningful a difference. So looking at stump height there wasn't as important as stump diameter. Okay, so looking back at oaks, all of this is just looking at, you know, everything we've seen so far is, you know, probability of sprouting and maybe a few years survival of sprouts. But this data is starting to get more at what we're actually interested in. And this is what's the probability that that stump sprout in year one will be a dominant tree in your stand at age 15. And so that's mid rotation. So that's likely to carry on out to the end of the rotation. Okay. And so this is looking at white oak and chestnut oak. And what they saw here is the same thing we've been seeing, the smaller stumps on the x-axis, more likely to sprout. And the probability is pretty high. It may be 70 to you know, 85% or so, um, not just to sprout, but to become a dominant tree at age 15, right? So that's pretty impressive. So that gets at the idea that stump sprouts have an advantage. They already have an intact root system. But what we see, they looked at two different sites. And so here's the site index in meters. Um, and so this solid line at the top here, that's gonna be a site index of around 60 feet at 50 years. And the site index at the bottom here is gonna be a site index of around 70 feet at 50 years. So is that what you would expect? That the stump sprouts on the higher quality sites are less likely to be a dominant tree? 
of Will shaking his head no. I think that's probably counterintuitive for most of us. I think most of us, if we had to guess, would say high quality site, yeah, they're gonna do better, right? So what may be going on here? Why is it backwards from what we would have guessed? Yeah, so you gotta look at competition, right? So when we start looking at what's going on there, it turns out you have less competition on a lower quality site. And because of that less competition, each individual tree, each individual stump sprout is gonna be more likely to make it to a dominant position. So this is gonna be a recurring theme when we get more and more into hardwood silviculture, where the sites we wanna manage our oaks on in particular the most are our highest site index sites. That's where we have the most difficult time managing them. So it's kind of an unfortunate uh, trend and the opposite of what we would hope. So that was a bunch of data on stump sprouting. Um, here's some data on root sprouting. And so as we look at root sprouting here, it's gonna be really important in a number of different species. Um, and so, you know, on the top right, you see that photo of trembling aspen and we've talked about that. Uh, how predation can still be an issue out there. The trembling aspen relies heavily on root sprouting. That photo in the bottom right is American beech. It's gonna be another tree that root sprouts pretty commonly, especially when that uh, large mature tree gets low in vigor, is damaged or is in decline, then you start seeing them sending up a whole bunch of root sprouts. Um, in that case, it may be a problem. So beech doesn't have as much timber value as some other trees like maples and other oaks. Um, and then beech are regularly massed. It doesn't have quite as much wildlife value. The mast is smaller and lower value. And so what we're seeing happen up in the Northeast a lot is they have an introduced disease, beech bark disease. And so beech bark disease will kill beech trees once they get to about four inches DBH or larger. And then what does the beech tree do? It root sprouts like crazy. Those get up to about four inches in diameter. They get killed off. And it's just this perpetual cycle and so what you end up with is these forests of small diameter beech trees that die before they ever produce any mast and before they ever get to any sort of size class where you can make anything out of them. And so the only thing you can really do there is herbicide them, but in some areas, you know, Vermont herbicide, uh, you know, may be frowned upon culturally by a lot of folks. And so they don't wanna use herbicides and then you're just kind of stuck with this low grade beech stand. So, so sometimes um, root sprouting can be a problem. If you cut down a sweet gum in your front yard, root sprouting is probably gonna be an issue, right? Anytime you cut down a sweet gum, it, it's like the center of a wheel and has these spokes coming off it where you end up with these lines of seedlings popping up. And that's where you can see, that's where those coarse roots have been the whole time. You just didn't know where they were. So, so root sprouting can be important. Root sprouting can also you know, have a downside to it. If it's a weed species you've got, that's root sprouting. Okay, let's think a little bit more about existing seedlings. Let me set this study up for you. So we're much closer to home now. This is a study Brian Lockhart did in Angelina County. So one county south of us. And so this was a, a kind of heterogeneous bottomland oak area. So you would have had some mixed topography from really wet areas to some ridges that were a little bit drier. And so this stand was 75% oaks and it went from white oak and maybe the swamp chestnut oak and cherry bark oak on those higher ridges to slightly lower ridges where you would have had the water oak and willow oak. <clears throat> and then you would have had some clay flats in some areas that would be dominated by overcup oak. So it's this mix of different oak trees and they put in a thinning, they got pretreatment data in 99, then they put in a thinning and followed it out for three years after that. But those four rows in the table, they looked at three, four different size classes of seedlings. And three of them are pretty straightforward. One of them we'll want to talk about a little bit more just to get everyone on the same page. But <clears throat> that top row of seedlings less than a foot tall. So who's pretty confident they could go find a seedling and tell if it's less than a foot tall? Hopefully every hand, right? That's pretty straightforward. One to three feet tall, pretty straightforward. And then that fourth row, one inch to three inches in DBH, you get your D tape out, that's pretty straightforward. But it's that third row that can confuse folks at first. And so that's a seedling that's greater than three feet tall, but less than one inch in DBH. So now they're blending height and diameter. So it gets kind of confusing how that can be one size class, right? So as we start thinking about it, what's the DBH of a three foot tall seedling? Zero. What's the DBH of a four foot tall seedling? Zero. As soon as it hits four and a half feet, suddenly it has a DBH. 
And then we quit worrying about height because you don't want to carry a height pole around with you. And we start worrying about diameter instead. So that's how it is one discrete size class, even though it blends height with DBH. So as we look at this, if I look at the pretreatment column on the far left, we have about 3,300 of these oaks out there. If I look at the 2001 column, three years post-treatment on the far right, I have about 2,100 out. So did my stand get more regeneration potential or less? Looks like less. I went from 3,300 oaks out on the ground to 2,100. So the harvest damaged some of them. Um, and you know, you can see that because right after they harvested it in the same year, you're down to 1,800, which isn't too much less than that 2,100. Not a whole bunch came back in the few years in between. So it looks like it's not ideal, but let's look at this a little more carefully. In terms of creating a dominant tree at the end of your next rotation, would you rather count on a seedling that's six inches tall or a sapling that's three inches in DBH? Which is more likely to make it into the overstory in your next stand? The sapling. Think about this. You can even cut that sapling down and it's going to re-sprout. We know it's a young and small diameter tree, so it's very likely to re-sprout. So even if you cut it down, you can still count on it for regeneration in your next stand. Um, if, if you run over a six inch tall seedling, is that going to re-sprout? Probably not. Probably not. So those larger trees are worth a lot more to us. Well, look at what happened. Even though in 2001 we have less trees than we had before we did this thinning, Basically, our smallest size class of less than one foot tall seedlings, that's where we took all the loss. But if you look, we actually had almost twice as many one foot to three foot tall trees. We had more than three times as many greater than three foot, less than one inch diameter trees. And then we had slightly more in the one to three inch sapling size class. And so you have fewer trees, but you have more in the size classes that are more important to what's going to regenerate your next stand. Yeah, Will. Taking uh, spreading into account, um, would it be a logical uh, management to mow an area to kill all the surrounding vegetation to get it sprout at times to regenerate to above the competition? So mowing is expensive in terms of competition control. Um, if you had herbaceous vegetation out here, you could apply a product like Oust. The active ingredient is sulfmetron. As long as your seedlings have not broken dormant bud, you can put two to four ounces of oust out per acre, control herbaceous vegetation, and not damage your oaks. So that would be much more cost effective. But with this natural regeneration, this is a thin, okay? So when you did the PTA lot lab and you thinned it, or when you wrote your prescription on the HGT stand and you thinned it, were you thinking about regenerating? No, a thinning just manages the stands you've got. That's what we got to think about with pine. But now when we move into hardwood systems, when you think about a thin, the thin is still, the purpose is to manage the stand you have. But if you can do something that improves your regeneration potential, that's going to help you naturally regener regenerate it at the end of the rotation. So with hardwood systems like this, you always want to be thinking about, can I do something with what I'm doing to manage my stand that's going to help me in terms of regeneration potential? And we'll talk about that a little bit more later this semester when we get more into bottom line hardwood systems. So, um, so mowing is not something you see very commonly done. It's expensive. But here on a long rotation, you may not even be using herbicides. Um, it may just be, you know, multiple thins uh, gradually building up a pool of advanced regeneration. So that's why we focus on advanced regen so much, because those advanced regeneration trees in some parts of the south, east of the Mississippi River, you don't count on a shelter wood to get you seedlings growing to release as your next cohort. You need a shelter wood to grow existing advanced regeneration even larger and then you release that with the removal cut. So in some areas with some ecosystems, advanced regeneration is your best and only option for natural regeneration. Um, we were out on a study a few years ago, not a study, but a, a small vertically integrated forest products company just west of Baton Rouge and they were managing hardwoods. This was Mississippi Alluvial Valley, so not much pine there, if any. So they're managing hardwoods and they go out and they've been clear cutting land. And what they find 70% of the time, they'll come back a year, two years, five years later. And that clear cut area has naturally regenerated with a sufficient density of desirable species. And they can let it go until the point they get it to their first thin. Okay, so it worked 
literally all they had to do was clear cut it. About 30% of the time, maybe the year was too wet or too dry, or the site had some other issue with it compositionally. They go out there and they don't have sufficient density of desirable species. At that point, they can then spray herbicides and plant hardwood trees. And because they're managing these hardwoods for timber, they'll literally plant, here's a row of green ash, here's a row of bald cypress, which bald cypress is often thought of a hardwood from a timber standpoint, even though it's a gymnosperm. You know, here's a row of cherry bark oak. So they'll actually just line them up as rows of species. That way the logging jobs at the end of the rotation are more efficient. So, so even if you can't get advanced regen to work, even if you can't get natural regen to work, you know, planting is a backup plan. So that's why we started with advanced regen. It's important. But now I want to think a little bit more about seed rather than sprouts. And so I've already shown you this. That's how many seed trees you need per acre out for our southern pines and how to space them. So we know a lot about getting good regeneration from seed with our southern pines. How many seeds did we need per acre for longleaf to regenerate? What was our target? 50,000 50, was our target for longleaf. Here's some data out of a more serotonous species. So remember, none of our southern pines are serotonous. Lodgepole pine out west is serotonous. So this is data from Yellowstone where they counted cones per tree, they counted seeds per cone, and then they figured out how many trees per acre they had. And so they were able to calculate that in these areas where 90% of the cones were closed on between half and two thirds of the trees, they had between a million and three million seeds per acre. So this is a much tougher environment in the South, cold, high elevation, short growing season, but they had a lot of seed out there, okay? When you look, you know, again, out West at some of these areas that may have more difficult climates for trees to grow in, um, you, you know, really may need to, you know, get good amount of seed on the ground to get good regeneration. So what I have for you, this is data taken from out west, all in mixed spruce fir. Um, and what you're seeing is the dotted line on top is the cumulative amount of seed available in a partial cut. So think about a shelter wood. And then that bottom solid line is the cumulative amount of seed available in a clear cut. And that x-axis is just years after harvest. And so you can see our, our best national forest out here for regeneration is the payette. Um, and as you look, what's the better option on the payette there? It's the dotted line, so that's our partial cut, so our shelter wood, but it may not be a big difference. That bottom number on the y-axis is a thousand. Um, and so if you need a thousand seeds per acre, if that's your target, uh, you can get there in four years with a shelter wood, you can get there in eight years with a clear cut. So in that case, you may be fine with either system. Look at the panel just to the right of it, low. Now we're looking at the Uinta National Forest. If you needed a thousand seeds, seedlings per acre, Sorry, this is seedlings, not seeds per acre. If you needed a thousand seedlings per acre, what's your option? Uh, you don't have one. And you can try planting out here, but you know, you may be getting 30% survival or lower in some of these areas. But as you look between the partial cut and the clear cut, what's the clear best option there? Partial cut. You, you need to go with the partial cut out here and you just count on it. This is a tough stand to regenerate. That's gonna be a tougher area to work in. So we're seeing regional differences and these regional differences are interacting differently with these different regeneration methods out west, just like we saw in the Appalachians with oaks. So a lot of that conditionality again. Um, so this is a photo of some Ponderosa pines I took out west, maybe in 2017 or so. Um, they're in this small little enclosure. Uh, this was a research study that they were conducting on the Coconino National Forest. And so you can see the biggest of those saplings is now maybe four inch DBH or so. So how old do you think they are? It's older than you think. It's older than you think, but how, how old do you think they are? A couple hundred, 25 years. So 25 years, a couple hundred, so 40, we're all over the map, right? Hard to tell that, that they had put this study in, they had put this research plot in a hundred years earlier. So in a hundred years, one of those saplings made it up to about four inches DBH. So when you get out to parts of the West that are real arid, you may be growing forests in areas with 16 to 18 inches of rain a year, growth is gonna be really slow. So a little bit of a different perspective than what we have here in the South. In the South, that would be five years, right? <laughs> it would not be long. Okay, 
what I want to wrap up with today is just a, a little bit of uh, a look at seed production in oaks. Um, so first let's look at what size oaks you want to produce a bunch of acorns. Um, and then on the next two slides, what we'll look at is the periodicity of acorn production. Um, so this was a pretty neat study done in the Southern Appalachians. Um, and this was published in the Journal of Forestry in 1944. So right towards the end um, of the Second World War. Um, as you look here, we've got five different oak species and they're the same five that was used by Chad Atwood in that first study we looked at with the bar graphs. So scarlet oak, white oak, black oak, chestnut oak, and northern red oak. And so as you look at these different oak trees, how big a tree do you want if you want to max out acorn production? And so that's acorns per tree per year in hundreds on the y-axis. So 20 there is 2,000 acorns per tree per year. So how big an oak do you want? It depends on the species. So we've got another it depends. So this depends on the species. So for black oak, which is the sort of dashed green line there, what's the take home message? Bigger is better, bigger is better, okay? For scarlet oak, what's the take home message here? That's this top line. Yeah, you, bigger is better there, and they're actually stopping there. Uh, scarlet oak is one of our few oaks that's actually heavily impacted by chestnut blight. Um, all the oaks are in the chestnut family, right? The Fagaceae, the beech family. And so they don't get much bigger than that because the blight will, you know, cause heart rot and issues and they fall apart. So bigger is better, but scarlet oak only gets so big. That's the problem with scarlet oak. And then you look at some of our other oaks, such as white oak and northern red oak, but especially northern red oak here in the solid blue line. How big do you want those northern red oaks to be? Just over 20 inches. And then you expect seed production potential to decline. So whether you're managing for timber and you're using natural regeneration or you're managing for wildlife and you're just interested in a lot of mass production, it's going to be important to know uh, how big of trees you may want. And again, the relationship varies. Okay, so periodicity of acorn crop production. So, you know, what are some of the common things you'll hear on how often oaks will mass? So three to five years. What else have people heard? Random. Yeah, so what we commonly hear is kind of one year for the white oaks, two years for the red oaks. People, you know, I hear that one probably the most commonly. And so that, that's, that's a pretty common misconception. And so what that's based on, what that misconception is based on, so if a flower on an oak tree is fertilized in spring, if it's a white oak, one growing season. So one year, that's gonna drop an acorn this fall, okay, that would have been fertilized back in the spring of 2020. The red oaks that had their acorns pollinated in spring of 2020, they're gonna drop acorns in fall 2021. So it goes over two growing seasons, so two years. That's how long it takes each tree to produce an acorn, but that says nothing about our flowers being produced and pollinated in each given year because that's what would dictate, are they dropping acorns every single year or not, okay? So as we start looking at the data, here's, again, Southern Appalachians from 1936 to 1942. This is acorn crop production. Do you see an every year and every other year pattern there? You do not, okay? It's a random mess, right? So if you look at this, let's look at this top line here. So first off, 1938 is a great year for acorn production. Scarlet oak is the big winner. White oak is producing pretty good, better than any oak does in some other years, but it's the least productive in this year. Compare that with 1942, another really good year. Now white oak is the best, not the worst in that really good year. And then you look in some other years, white oak's right in the middle, or here white oak in 1940 is the best amongst a bad year. 1941, you get a complete failure. Nothing produces anything, okay? Um, then you look at black oak, it does pretty good in 38. It's middle of the pack. It's your best producer in 39. It may be your worst producer in some other years. Okay, it's your worst producer in 42. And so it's just all over the map. There's no clear periodicity. You know, it's just random. If you're managing this stand for wildlife and you want masks, what's the take home message? Have a bunch of different kind of oaks and hopefully one will do something this year, but you're still gonna have years where you have failure. 
Now, this is a part of the country where they are prone to late freezes because of that mountainous terrain. And late freezes will kill the flowers, which results in crop failures. So that's one thing that may be going on there. So let's look at data a little bit closer to home. When, when pollinated, yeah. That's why in March, it's all over your car, right? So the pines and the oaks are mostly wind pollinated. Yeah. Okay, um, so as we look here, this is data from East Texas and Louisiana from 1950 to 1967. So we've got a really long time series here, which is pretty impressive. They've got seven species in this data set. And as we look at those seven species, I couldn't fit swamp chestnut oak in there and have it look good, so I put cow oak. Cow oak's another common name for Quercus michoei. And then Quercus alba, Quercus stellata, blue jack oak, black jack oak, southern red oak, water oak. And so you all learned all these species in dendro. So they got data for all seven of them for about five years. And then they continued collecting data for just three of them. Um, so they had that 17 year time series. So as we look in the time period when they're collecting data for all seven species, same story that we just saw in the Southern Appalachians, right? It's a hot mess. It's just completely random spaghetti jumble of lines, okay? And then as we start looking at the longer term data, Southern Red Oak has a heck of a year in 1960. Um, it has some good years here in the mid fifties. It has a lot of other bad years. So it's just all over the place. Look at blackjack oak. It's that most obvious dark black line near the bottom. Do you ever want to rely on blackjack oak if you need a lot of mass for wildlife? No, and we're not surprised looking at that. Blackjack oak and bluejack oak. Bluejack's pretty low over here too. They didn't track it for too long. Those are on our really xeric sites. So these are often small, poorly formed oaks. So, you know, they're not ideal. Um, and then what we do see here, this is some of the few data I've seen that does suggest that there may be in certain circumstances, some periodicity in acorn production but it's only for post oak. If we look at all these species, it's only post oak. Maybe if they had tracked white oak out longer, we would have seen something hard to say, but it looks like the post oak is pretty convincingly masting every other year. It doesn't quite work here in the late fifties, but the late fifties in our region was a pretty severe drought, made the 2011 drought look like not much. It, it hit the panhandle in West Texas more than East Texas, but still. But throughout this whole period, it's, pretty close to about every other year, every three years or so in here. But is post oak a white oak or a red oak? It's a white oak. So it only takes it one year to produce those acorns, but it still seems to be masting about every other year. So that's not tied at all to the one or two year thing, right? So maybe post oak has periodic acorn crops, maybe white oak would, or some of these others would if we track them longer. But you can see they track blackjack oak for a long time, they track southern red oak for a long time. There is no clear periodicity that emerges there, right? So, so acorn production is random, it seems. It's gonna be very difficult to predict. So try to have a bunch of different species out there. So. Any questions on natural regeneration?